Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> this video is to let you know that the book is officially ready. Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap, Book 1, is available now on my website. Um, it's 200 pages and uh, much longer than I originally thought it was going to be. It is a book one, which means this work will continue. And my plan is to hopefully have a book two in 2023. And your comments and suggestions after reading this particular book one will help me know where that research should go forward. At the end of this video, I'm going to read to you half of chapter one so that you can have the opportunity to hear a little bit of the book. But first, a few details of where it is and what to do with getting a hold of it if you want it. It's available as a PDF ebook. Um, I have plans that it might become a, a regular, you know, hardcover book or softcover book at some time. That takes another two, maybe even three months to, to get it into a book version. Um, and I didn't want to wait to have that information available to those who want to access it right now. We don't know how the next few months are going to go. Things in November might itself be strange. So I'm following the adage that if there's something you want to do, if there's something you want to read, if there's something you want to research, you should be doing that now. And that's the reason I'm making this available as a PDF book so that it is available to you now. The link is on the book donation page. It's in the description below. Um, just go to the website. The donate button there will take you over to PayPal. After you've made your chosen donation, uh, you'll have to wait a few seconds and it will redirect you to a thank you page where the link to, for the book to be found and then you can read it or download it from there. You know the drill. Um, the price for the book is a minimum donation of $5, which I think is fair for a 200 page book and 10 plus hours of work every day for the last several months. I want to mention that even though the book has gone through several edits, there are still, and very good edits by very good editors, there's still going to be some grammar and spelling errors that creep in, um, especially including sometimes I've added little sentences or parts, change parts of things after the edit had been done. So those of you who are early readers can help me find out what is left, what hasn't been caught. And I'm going to put a video up on uh, my backup channel. That video again, link is below. And that's where over the next week or so, if you happen to, if you have the book and you happen to come across um, some type of grammatical error, you can just post it in that other video. Don't post it in the comments here. Post it in the other video. And it's great because, because you're leaving it in the comments, uh, once somebody has caught one, we don't have to have continuous comments mentioning the same one. You just look in the comment section. If no one else has seen what you've seen, great. You put it in. If someone else has, great. Move along. And it's a way to give us a better a better version. I may put together a second version next Friday. It depends how many edits are found and, and how much needs to be done in the next uh, in the next little while. The content won't change. I'm happy with the content of the book. Um, but if there is enough to demand a cleanup, then what I'll do is get the new version ready. And as soon as that is, and I have the new one posted, everyone who's bought it between now and then will get a new free upload of the book. That would be like next Thursday, Friday, if it happens. That's why I'm asking for your email in the PayPal donations, because if I don't have your email, you can't get sent the free update. Other than that, once the book is then ready, it just it is as it is, and um, we'll see where it goes from there. Again, I'm really, I feel really good about this project. It's it's not often uh, I put something together, and normally it takes takes it took me eight years to put together Falling for Truth. I'm very happy with what's been put together in a very short period of time with a lot of work. I think it covers a lot of areas. You can see the table of contents page. It's up here on your screen now. But it's also on the website. Uh, and you can, it's not going to tell you too much, but it is going, this book is going through hopefully a tremendous amount of areas from not just the things you would expect. What is a reincarnation trap? What is this, what a soul might be? Uh, how are things trapped here? What is the near-death experience? What is the afterlife realm like? But it's going into origin stories from the Cathars, from the Gnostics. I have a chapter completely on the Cathars to discuss a group that basically had the principle of 
ending a reincarnation trap and not being coming back to a realm that they saw as created by an evil demiurge, the Rex Mundi, what can we learn from them? I take you through some possibilities of things you can do, uh, because I also want there to be things in this book that are related to action. I don't want it to be just theory and intellectual ideas. So I discuss things like uh, William Bullman's death action plan. There's re re uh, recapitulation, uh, lucid dreaming. Um, I take you through prayer. So a few ideas of things to start putting in your life beyond just contemplating, thinking, and digging. What are some things we can start putting into our life to start preparing for this experience and, pre and preparing our mind if we're going to continue to see very clearly? Of course, a lot of people won't like the content immediately. They will reject the concept because it doesn't fit into their, their standard box of belief. And um, I was in, in some of those places, too, for quite a long time. Certainly after my death experience, I've been looking into these subjects for five years previously, ten years previously to my death experience. And then the death experience turned me a, a different direction. I see it was a bit manipulated. So allow yourself to look into material that doesn't necessarily always agree with what you currently agree with. That's where something in this book could be value to get you to ask some questions, look into some things. Then you might say everything in my book I don't agree with, but at least you've taken time to look into it and ask these questions for yourself, which I think is given where we are in the insane reality we're in. We're in, like I mentioned, we're in kind of a zeitgeist and this kind of material is starting to bubble up. I'm, I'm starting to notice it in a lot of places. I would have never noticed it before. Something's going on. And I hope this book is going to be a contribution to what's out there. I really feel it is going to be. Um, like I say, I, I think it's, I think it's going to present a lot. And, and even right to the last chapter, a lot of books really don't have a last chapter. It just kind of says, oh, the book was good. I hope you liked it. Kind of, uh, I take you into Carlos Castaneda's Active Side of Infinity. I take you into Angelica Agonostu's Can You Stand the Truths? Ideas and presentations of the various levels of the astral realm, the various levels of the possible soul harvesting that goes on in different areas, showing why the standard near-death experience might only be showing a tiny piece of what is a giant true after-death experience, in a sense. It's like I called it a propaganda campaign um, to make people like the white light and going into the recycling trap. So go over to the website. You can check out the link below if you're interested in it. You, by all means, make your donation, to get a chance, start reading it, see what you think. I'm going to be curious to hear what people have to say about it. Um, the first chapter will come up as a sample chapter on the website on that page in, in a few days' time. But for now, I'm going to read you the first half of that chapter below. Um, thanks again. Thanks for your support. Thanks for being a part of this process. I look forward to seeing where it's going to go, and I look forward to seeing if this book has some value to all of you. I'm hoping that it will. Here comes the sample chapter. Chapter 1. Harvest Moon True philosophers make dying their profession, and to them of all people, death is the least alarming. It is the prospect of attaining their lifelong desire. Wisdom. Plato. Where are you? What if you woke up one morning, say this morning, with the crazy notion that everything you've ever been told was a lie? Everything you were taught in school, from your parents, from religion, and from TV, was a form of deception. That all the systems you trusted, that you believed were created for your best interest, were false. A calculated series of lies designed as a type of control mechanism to keep you and everyone under the spell of wizards who control this realm. What if you found that even all the areas that seemed designed to, to assist you, such as religion, spirituality, or self-help, were all part of the deception as well? What if you woke up one moment, say this moment, and realized that you in fact had died, and that you were in the after-death realm? A tunnel of white light appears before you, and a loving angel or your loving grandmother are there calling you towards the light. What are you going to do? Is going to this light a blessing? or the way you get trapped further. What if there's an exit? A topic that has had much focus in the last 10 years or so 
comes under the subject soul traps, and in a nutshell is saying that non-human beings either created this realm or control this realm and bring human souls into an artificial world construct. They do this in order to farm humans for food, using our energy, mainly in the form of fear and other negative emotions like the movie Monsters, Inc. as their source. When we die, we get tricked at the key moment when we can turn away from all of this by aliens disguised as beings of light or former loved ones. You would then go into a tunnel of light or up a stairway of light. Doing either will cause us to enter the reincarnation cycle and be back into another life in the soul farm. Wayne J. Bush Wayne Bush's above quote gives all the information you need on the subject, and the next 200 pages will be an examination of the five sentences above. To do that, we are going to have to examine a lot of evidence about life and death. This includes what are known as near-death experiences, concepts such as karma, reincarnation, and sin. A foundation discussion point for this book will be the allegory of Plato's cave. That is found in his book, Republic. It is a story about a cave of prisoners being tricked into living a life of illusion. Researchers attempting to explain the analogy of Plato's cave and its exit simply. They fit their analysis into their beliefs of this world, and few question whether it is a useful analogy. This book is not concerned much with traps in this realm. This book is looking for the foundation of all the traps. Generally, when a person has a near-death experience, they present a similar story. They enter a realm that is confusing until they see either a white light, often a tunnel, with perhaps angel-like beings or dead relatives encouraging them towards this light. Some meet a stairway instead. Those who experience this light say it is the most beautiful experience that they could imagine. Love personified, some report, a place they did not want to leave. At some point, they are told, either after a type of life review or by simple presentation, that it is not their time, that they have work or a mission to complete, or they have more to learn, and are sent back to their bodies on earth. The experience tends to transform them, and often they change their life in, dr in drastic ways. Generally, they tend to become kinder, more loving, and lose their fear of death. It all sounds good, doesn't it? Or is it too good to be true? I will share some of these near-death experiences in Chapter 4. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians But these are not the only experiences people have had in the after-death world. Many of these other experiences tend to indicate that the standard white light story and loving angels is nothing but a trick. That any soul who falls for it has only achieved their continued enslavement. I began to wonder on examining the standard story if those who had nice experiences were given them as part of what I call a propaganda campaign. Those who are sent back here, often against their will, might have been given a light version of the experience to write some books on and tell how the white light tunnel is their friend. If you are running a deception that needed souls to stay trapped in this realm, how many near-death experiences would you want to see the real event? As few as possible. That needs to be kept in mind. The 15% minority of experiences might be the ones that are going to be the most complete parts of the, of the NDE, while the standard 85% are those who are getting a strong dose of being fooled. Non-standard near-death experiences get examined in Chapter 9. One of the beliefs that the human experience has become based on is that we live in a wonderful world, made by a loving creator, a place where all of our wishes can come true so we can grow, learn, and evolve. If we just have enough faith, then we will go, then we will get to enter a heavenly realm for eternity filled with clouds, harps, and angels. This book will present the thesis that we live in the exact opposite of this standard presentation. My research, through the ancient groups of Gnostics and Cathars, as well as the work of modern philosophers, will reveal that we live in an artificial simulated world, created by an evil deity, called the Demiurge by Gnostics. This reality we inhabit is not a new creation, but a copy of a more real realm that is our home. When examined more closely, this world copy appears more like what we now call artificial intelligence. Artificial meaning not organic, not alive as we think of that term. Our souls were tricked to enter this simulation, which has been devised in such a way 
to keep us here to harvest our energy as a power source to keep the simulation running. Some might respond, this sounds insane. But is it? Perhaps this thesis will be a clear explanation of our reality and the experience of all around us of constant suffering and pain. It is they, gray aliens, who await in the light when a human being dies. The human being is then recycled into another body and the process begins all over again. Hence the light and tunnel at death trap. Scanning someone they wish to recycle as they near death, the aliens discover who the person was close to and that has died. They project the person's image into a white light tunnel and the image waves you in, waves you in deeper. If you choose to follow, you can be trapped and sent to another incarnation of their choice. These entities view Earth as a big farm. Val Valerian This topic about Earth being a farm of souls has been around for many decades, but generally on the fringes of any alternative research. Gurdjieff often claimed that we were here on Earth to become food for the moon. Most thought that he was being symbolic, but likely not. Do you know that the most famous moon during the year is known as the Harvest Moon? Is it really about humans harvesting their crops, or is the moon harvesting its human crops? The subject was brought up by famed out-of-body researcher Robert Monroe, who in Chapter 12 of his book Far Journeys in 1971 claimed aliens required what he called loosh energy. Our realm became one built to provide this loosh to the alien controllers. I discuss his book in detail in Chapter 3. Val Valerian, who claimed to be a former CIA agent, wrote a series of Matrix books beginning in 1990 with the same subject matter of Earth being a farm. Carlos Castaneda, in his final book, Active Side of Infinity, discussed how parasitic entities have been harvesting us for energy for centuries. Part of this process was to give us their mind, a parasitic ego, so that we will be easier to control and behave in the negative ways they wish us to, in order to, in, to, in order to increase our energy output. The lack of people thinking about the food chain baffles me. A minnow eats a mosquito and takes that energy into itself. A fish eats the minnow and takes that energy into itself. A human eats the fish and takes that energy into itself. The human being is believed to be supreme, as nothing takes our energy. If humans had a clearer understanding of reality, the statements should continue. An archon eats the human, and that takes the energy into itself. The archon takes that energy, plugs it back into the matrix simulation, which is then sent back in to reach a new mosquito, and the vortex trap keeps spinning. The word archon I described earlier on in a footnote, which is a name the Gnostics used for agents of the Demiurge, agents of the Creator, agents of the Evil One, that in a sense, how will we say it, look after the realm for the Demiurge. This examination is going to be hard for almost everyone to read. Because, because of our most held on and cherished hopes and wishes are going to be put to the test. These include the idea of free will, that somehow this reality was set up so that we can do and experience as we choose. However, we will be judged later on for our choices. The problem with, the, with this theory is there are many moments in people's lives when they feel they had no choice or it was destined to happen. And so which events are free will choices and which are destiny? It gets cloudy at that point. A video game character believes they have free will as well, but they only act they only act based on the programming that their character has been given as code. What if we are used for the whims of another, as the robot hosts on the TV show Westworld are used by the supposed human guests who act like parasites towards them? Did you really choose your breakfast this morning, or was that a programmed moment inserted into a computer eons ago? Another topic that most take for granted as true is the Christian concept of sin. Even though we were never given a manual, of, of, a manual for life on entering, nor any real idea of who or what will judge our, action, our actions. The idea of karma, similar to sin, where the good things we do get rewarded and the bad things we do get punished. Eastern religions have taken the concept of karma a bit further, 
adding it to reincarnation, where these karmic moments determine if you return as an important person, a lowly peasant, or even, God forbid, an animal. The topic of reincarnation surrounds all of us. The subject of avoiding a reincarnation soul trap was the foundation belief behind the group in southern France known as the Cathars, whom the Catholic Church exterminated beginning in 1209 AD in their first crusade and inquisition against their own people. However, in the last 20 years, the subjects of soul traps and harvesting energy has taken on new levels. Another key element in this discussion is what can be called the memory wipe, personified in the ancient world by the hermetic cup of forgiveness cup of forgetfulness and the Chinese goddess Meng Po and her soup of forgetfulness. Right in this word we are getting a sense of what is going on, forgetfulness, to no longer remember the full or the whole of what we are. Many will vehemently claim that the idea of reincarnation is false because they do not remember any of their own lives. And even the Pope denies the concept. We get one life and that is it. Most who follow a Western religion will reject the idea of reincarnation immediately. Even though when you look into the early history of all those religions, reincarnation could be found in its early teachings. Christianity might have removed it as late as 525 AD. Likely the topic was removed to hide this fact. People will not take actions on something they do not believe exists. The Eastern religions still keep the concept of reincarnation, but it is also nowhere like its original presentation. Buddhism now, for the most part, is all about how to live like a nice boy or girl so you come back and live a happy and wealthy life the next time. Buddhists claim that to follow the Buddha's teachings is the way to exit the cycle, but those teachings tend to be mostly moral constraints and sitting with your eyes closed. This is not really preparation for death, but more like a distraction from life and death. Reincarnation still exists in the Hindu realm, and they try to focus on the Bhagavad Gita as the centerpiece of their teaching on it. However, I see that text in an, earth, in, an in an entirely different way, as more of a trick to stay stuck in the reincarnation cycle, and not the way to exit. In other words, souls started off as pure spiritual entities, and are incarnated into matter. Why? To return home to where they started from, pure again? And having gained what? Virtual life experiences useless to the spiritual plane. Angeliki and Agnostu. Some might say reincarnation is a false concept. Possibly. If you are on that side of this discussion, I ask you take some time with this and consider if the thesis of this book is true, and how how would that how and how would how much would that change what you have believed? Or it could be that it is a good way to keep the reincarnation trap going by denying its existence. For most of the last 20 years, I was 50-50 on the idea of reincarnation. At times, I leaned no, and even semi-debunked the idea in my book Falling for Truth, claiming that as a part of one being, we are all lives, so there was nothing personal about any of them. Yet I kept wondering why some people, especially young children, seem to have vivid and complete memories of a very recent life in the past. Further examination has led me to believe that individual reincarnation is an almost 99.9% .9 certainty. Too much tested evidence is available of people who have access to information about the life of a long-dead person that they have no other way of having unless they were that person. The question has to be, is reincarnation here for our benefit as a type of school, evolution, or karmic experience as religions and the New Age want us to believe, or part of a trap of the soul as a group of researchers, researchers is now presenting? I made a YouTube video in early 2022 regarding the question if this reality is a school or a prison. It did not take long to realize that this is not a school, or you would remember your previous incarnations and lessons learned. One key facet that most near-death experiences reveal is that the return to, return to Earth in a human body includes the above-mentioned memory wipe, where everything from that previous life is forgotten. This alone clearly indicates that this is not a place of learning and growth. If you touch stinging nettle without gloves, your hand gets stung and it hurts. You remember that, and from then on, if you want to pick some nettle, you wear gloves. That is learning. Remembering is a key step in the process. 
But if on each incarnation you have to go back to touching the nettle to find out if it stings, that is not learning or growth, but insanity. That is our reality. At least when we go to normal school, we remember what happened the previous year. We don't go into grade 5 and forget everything from grades 1 to 4. Yet in the reincarnation cycle, we seem subject to nothing gets carried over. The memory wipe will happen again, and all will be forgotten. This leads to life as a human on Earth being a deception, where we might even be tricked into signing types of soul contracts to indicate what is going to happen to us, generally forms of suffering. Pain and suffering are the constant elements of this realm for all creatures, in between moments of non-suffering that may act like places to recharge our energy battery. The television series Westworld, at least season one, is an excellent presentation of this concept. Each time a Westworld robot has died, it is taken to mission control for a cleanup. This includes a memory wipe, so that the last incarnation is forgotten and they go back into the field with their programming intact. So they can be shot up and raped again. This is a big reason for the memory wipe prior to new incarnations, because if we really could remember how much suffering we had gone through, lifetime after lifetime, we would have long ago shut down the whole, shut down our reincarnations. The trap can only work with the memory wipe. We are just here to be used. Exactly what we are being used for, energy food for the system as speculated by most, or entertainment non-player character pieces for non-human entities who come into this realm, or as an experiment, is hard to verify. When the memories start to appear in Westworld for Dolores and Maeve of how they've been treated, a new inner strength emerges for them to break out of the Westworld prison. It also seems that whatever body we get from reincarnation is random. The body chosen is not really indicative of how we lived previously, nor is it tied to any moral judgments based upon us. That means what we do here, be real nice or real bad, is not going to make any difference if we get sucked back into the matrix and into a new body, or even the same body, over and over in a type of continual time loop. That means reincarnation is occurring, and we get tricked into continuing the cycle, in a sense we wind up agreeing. But we are not coming back to learn anything or grow, just to be recycled for another round of being used and our energy harvested. How you live really makes no difference, destroying the ideas of karma, only how you believed you lived. If you have enough naughty stuff in your past, that becomes more elements to be tricked into getting being told you have to come back because you were a bad or naughty person. Once the more kind and compassionate you have been, the less is waiting in the life review. This gets even more challenging when we begin to realize that many of the moments of our lives are being directly manipulated by parasitic entities. Eve Lorgan wrote an excellent book on the subject called Alien Love Bite. Besides, if someone had a thousand lifetimes, surely that person must have learned everything by now. Given that most of those lives would have been fraught with intense suffering, does someone really need 997 lives out of 1,000 full of pain to learn? I don't know about you, but I learned better in school from teachers who were kind, took time with me, and encouraged me to be creative not someone who whacked me over the head with a stick constantly. Planet Earth is stick-whacking land. Given the way 2020 to 2022 has played out, more and more people are coming to that realization. This trap seems to be sprung just after death. In this very confused state, the soul is even more, more vulnerable. Few have taken time in their waking life to learn lucid dreaming or to astral travel how to keep their awareness beyond their physical body. And so, when in the after-death realm, the average person gets sucked into the experience similar to when having a dream, where we get swept along, no matter how strange it is. The trap is already being set up with the lack of awareness in our dreams. Carlos Castaneda placed much work on the being aware in our dreams as a key part of the overall work. I'm starting to see more why that is. A high number of near-death experiences have what is called a life review. It tends to present our previous life in a way that mostly shows how bad or selfish we have been. Some near-death experiences have dealt with counsels that argue their fate, 
even contracts are the soul is pressured to sign. Then the white light appears, often with a loving figure as a guide, and the person enters. Somehow that movement towards the light seals our fate. We are back in the cycle. We may not reincarnate immediately. Some suggest it could be 30 earth years of waiting, and not necessarily in heavenly surroundings. And so, if not the white light, where should we go? We'll come back to that. To know what to do in the after-death realm, we have to get prepared while still in this one. It is actually one of the most important practices while in a body, but it tends to be downplayed against more standard practices of meditation, yoga, and mindfulness. Once a person finally sees that this is not a world set out to help us or grant us our wishes, but as a harvesting farm of our energy, we can make a shift. We stop focusing on how to become important and use our time to prepare for the moment where escape is possible. You have to take how you live to heart and have no regrets in this life, because regret can be a tool to trick you into returning. This is not, bu- this is not about becoming perfect or a saint, but to use this life to get everything figured out and get past the demiurge, because if you don't, you will be right back here after a Westworld memory wipe. No matter how much you moved along in the last life, you are back at square one in the new life, ignorant of everything once again. All the exalted knowledge we have come to believe in, either from books or people we come to admire, only has value in the moment. Chapter 2 will present a complete analysis of the allegory of Plato's cave. Usually taken as a symbol of being locked in a realm of illusion, Generally, when Plato's cave is mentioned in books or symbolized in movies, the focus is on how to improve your experience in the illusionary cave. These discuss how to change thoughts, see through control systems, change governments, live outside the normal system of commerce, maybe on a farm in the countryside. How to make your prison life more enjoyable. While learning to function differently in the dream world may have some value, as long as you are in the material realm, or the astral, or the superangelic, or even the void, then you are still in Plato's cave. What the analysis of Plato's cave fails to present is how to leave the cave and escape this this recycling slaughterhouse completely. That is the first half of chapter one. In a few days, I will post the entire first chapter as a sample on the same book page where the book is able to be purchased. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting, useful, and thought-provoking. Cheers.